Please open your Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and place your bookmark there. 1 Peter chapter 1. I think I scared Nathan. He came up and asked, how much time do I need? I said, an hour, hour and five minutes. And then he said, okay. And he cut back a, a lot of songs, I guess. I don't know. I, he might have had more, but I scared him out of them. So don't worry. I'm not really going to do an hour, an hour and five minutes. I have small children of my own. And so I, I sympathize with any parent trying to keep kids for an hour. We're not doing that tonight. I promise. First Peter 1, please. Verse 1. First Peter 1. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. That first phrase in verse 1, to the pilgrims scattered. Peter is a significant writer in this point in history, especially the first century church, because he's writing to people who are striving to be faithful to King Jesus, and yet the world around them is growing increasingly violent. They are increasingly against Christians. Now, we already know some of these details because the Jews were already against Christianity, and the Christians had fought with that for decades at this point. But in the early 60s, when Peter's writing this, what's about to begin is the Roman persecution of Christians. And that's going to take what was already bad and make it a thousand times worse. In fact, it's what's going to lead to Peter being killed in a few years. It's what's going to lead to Paul being killed in a few years. And yet what he wants these people to know is that they can stick it out, they can suffer, but glory will follow. I think we can all see some relevancy to that lesson, to that topic in our culture today because the world in which we live today is not the world in which our parents grew up living through. Issues like LGBTQ, issues like the sanctity of life in regards to abortion, issues that are going on on a daily basis, that's the culture in which we live. But further still, that's the culture in which our children are living through. They have got to stick it out. Now, as we think about suffering or persecution in that context, I don't know what may happen, and neither do you, and so that might be what's on the horizon for us. But I tell you what absolutely is happening, and it happens all the time, is we face suffering. We face hardships and heartaches and heartbreaks. I had a good friend last month who buried his wife from cancer in their mid-50s. I have another good friend who watched his father die in their backyard when he was 13 years old. And then 10 years later, he's laying his wife to rest from cancer. 23, 23 years old, and he's laid his father to rest and then his first wife. What do you tell people like that? What do you tell our children as they're being raised in this world and it does not want Jesus and it does not want Christianity and it is opposed to holy living and all the elements that come with humanity and come with our existence? Well, let me tell you. We can tell them they can make it. We can tell them that they can keep their faith and stay resolved to serve King Jesus and he'll, he's going to see them through this world. Folks, that's what Peter's going to tell these people. That's exactly what Peter's going to tell these people. You can make it. You are living as an exile. And yet as you pilgrimage through this world, where you're going is slowly home. I got three things for you. I'm a three-point guy. I got three things for you. Okay? Very simple. But if you'll take it and think about it, it'll help you. It'll help you. It's helped me. Number one, this is what you tell people living in a mess like this world. You tell them God is your Father. Now, look again at the text. Let's begin verse 3. This is 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That little word, begotten, the idea is that God 
fathered us. God is our Father. The reality of that information ought to be quite astounding to us. God is our Father. He is our Father by virtue of the resurrection. He's begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, John's gospel actually starts with that very point. That, that those Jesus had, he gave the right to become children of God. To become children of God, that's John 1, 12. Have you ever thought about such a lofty expression? That because of what Jesus did, we get to be called children of God. We get to call on Him as our Father. But all of this is intrinsically connected to the resurrection of Jesus. Well, what, a, what a greater doctrine is there that we could put our hope and our trust in? You know, God proves Himself in the resurrection of Jesus. In, in Romans 1 and verse 4, that's exactly what Paul says, that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the power of the resurrection. Folks, do you realize... There are few events as historically provable as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet that's what God offers as proof of who He is and what He's done through His Son. Do you ever stop and appreciate that? He's God. He doesn't have to prove who He is to you, does He? He's not under obligation to tell you He's the God of the universe, that He's the creator of life. And yet He offers us proof by raising His Son from the dead. And then through that resurrection giving us hope, giving us hope that, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, gives us assurance that one day we will come back from the dead. Folks, that's all part of God being our Father. That's going back to 1 Peter 1, that we have been begotten. We're maybe more familiar with that phrase, begotten, when we think about the genealogical records. Matthew 1 and Luke 3, oh, so-and-so begot, so-and-so. And we don't say begot. I don't. I don't think, I can't tell you the last time I said begot in a social setting. I have two daughters and I begot them. I, that's just, I don't do that. Folks, that's exactly what he's saying here about God. God fathered us through what he's done. Now, you may kind of scratch your head and think, well, how, how does that really impact me? When you know who your father is, you will live differently. It should impact the way you live every single day because you recognize that my Father is the sovereign King of the universe. Wow, what a lofty thought. I, I don't know if you did this. When I was a kid, we, we'd, we'd get on the playground with other kids. Typically, it was boys. I don't know why, but my dad can whip your dad. I mean, that's what we all knew it. My dad can whip your dad. My dad is bigger than your dad. My dad is stronger than your dad. My dad is smarter than your dad. And that's the way we played. A little, if you didn't know that, that's how little boys play on the playground. I actually could claim that. My dad, I'm not built like my dad. He's six foot one and weighs about 340. Don't ask me how I got what I've got, but I am not built like he is. Folks, do you recognize, you recognize you and I get to claim the title above titles that our father is God. We have been begotten. We have been fathered by Him. Part of that pledge from God then is that He will help us. He will guarantee us. He will support us because that's exactly what fathers do, isn't it? When you have that tire go flat in the middle of the grocery store, who are you calling? You call Dad. You call Dad because Dad's going to come help you. I was raised in, in Wilburton area of Oklahoma, and I could go into a parts store in Wilburton, Oklahoma, and the guy behind the counter knew who I was, and I could go up to the counter, and I could tell him I need this and I need that, and I told him exactly what account to put it on. And then at the end of that little process, what I did was sign my dad's name. That was probably illegal at this point. In hindsight, I, the legalities of that may be a little sketchy, but, but you know how I could do that? Because my father was the guarantee on that account. Folks, that's what you and I have, being blessed as children of God. We have our Father who backs the account, our Father who is there on our behalf, our Father who defends us. And that is precisely why he says in verse 3, we have been born again, we have been begotten, we have been fathered to a living hope. 
You see, a living hope is vibrant. When, when something is alive, this is going to be earth-shattering. That means it's not dead. It is alive. There is a pulse. There is substance. Folks, that is exactly what our hope in God is. It is alive and vibrant. And it's that way because God guarantees it through the resurrection of His Son. Do you think that that should make a difference in how we live every day? I, I'm going to have bumps and bruises and I'm going to make mistakes, but at the end of all of this, I'm, I'm going to keep going back to this point. God is my Father. My Father. You could go and compare the accounts of Jesus when He prays, when He's teaching the disciples how to pray. Matthew 6, Luke 11. There's a, there's a huge significance to the way Jesus says. And they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. You know what Jesus says? Pray like this. Our Father. Our, our, our Father. That means we share Him. He is our Father. And so as we're facing these hardships, we can have that confidence and that reassurance. And you may be kind of scratching your head thinking, oh, okay, I get it, we are fathered by God, but at what point in this process does that occur? Well, jump to the end of the chapter. Jump to the end of the chapter. I want you to see this. Verse 22, this is 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born... Again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Folks, don't you see what he's doing again? He's tying this right back in to the point at which God fathered us. He fathered us when we were born again. Yes, that is absolutely a reference to baptism. That's the point at which we died and were raised to walk in newness of life. Folks, don't discount those words and those phrases. Raised to walk in newness of life, being born again. Don't you see that's all part of this same process? That's the point at which we're fathered by God and that's the point at which we live a different life because God's our Father at that point. He is our Father by virtue of the recreation that occurs in baptism. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is a sense in which God is the Father of all humanity by virtue of creation. Okay? That's why we say sometimes every person's made in the image of God. Because in that sense, He's the Father of all humanity. But in a very special sense, the Christian can look at Him and say, That is my Father. That should help us. The second thing, and it feeds right out of that truth. God is your Father. Number two, this means then that you have an inheritance. Look at 1 Peter 1, verse 4. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Recognize what you have, what you stand to gain when God becomes your father. Folks, how many times does Peter have to stress this point? He says this is an inheritance. Notice the words incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. It's a little bit of the waxing of the elephant. Three different words that all mean the same point. And yet he's stressing the significance of that inheritance we have from God. This is something God gives because he's our Father. Something he imparts to those who are special and his Folks, that, that ought to impact what we do and how we live every day. We were having a discussion yesterday about, about giving a gun as an inheritance to somebody. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. If I know my dad is going to leave me with his, his he's got a sweet white SKS. Okay, if I know he's going to give me that white SKS, he says, son, this gun is yours. The next time I'm walking through Bass Pro Shop, I'm not going to drool over the SKSs behind the counter. Uh, it's just that's not a rifle that's going to appeal to me as much because my father has one that's more sentimentally valuable to me. He says he's going to give it to me. Folks, that, that, that's a minor, a minor thing. May, maybe something a little bit more relatable in this particular part of the world. If you look at the four or five 
richest people in the world, you know that all of them, the, there are four or five of the top 20, trace back to Sam Walton. If you don't know who Sam Walton is, that's the guy who made Walmart. It's the founder of Walmart. Did, did you appreciate what I just four out of the four or five out of the top 20 richest people in the world carry his name? Do you think they live differently than you and I do? They've got billions, billions to their name. You think they live differently than we do? Well, they sure face the same heartaches and struggles we do. There's no question about that. They have ups and they have downs and they have anxieties and they have depressions and they have frustrations and fears and all of those things. But I'm going to tell you right now, they go into a bookstore, they buy any book they want in there and never check their debit card account. They're just little things that they do differently because they know what they have. Folks, that is precisely what we have when we're talking about our spiritual inheritance by virtue of God being our Father. We have an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled. It does not fade away and it is reserved in heaven for you. Now that should change the way I think every day. To know that what I have is so far beyond the value that this world can offer me. How many times do we hear those sad little stories where somebody is worth tons of money and through a process of bad investments, they end up squandering it all and what they leave to their children is nothing. Have you heard that happen before? Folks, do you appreciate what he's promising to us right here cannot be taken away? It, it cannot depreciate in value and inflation does not touch it. And yet it's there. And what God says is, if you'll just stick with me, if you'll just stay faithful to me, it's not going anywhere. It is reserved for you. It holds your spot in 1 Peter. We spent a little time in Ephesians 1, but I want to tie in some of these phrases again. We spent a little time here Sunday morning, the first lesson. But I just I want you to see these, these points as they come back right in to the points Peter's making. This is Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, as Paul's in the middle of really praising God for what God has done, verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he has made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together and one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Notice this. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we should first trusted, who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of His glory. Two concepts, two concepts in this text. One of them is that we are adopted by God. One of them is that our inheritance is so beyond our ability to comprehend. Both of those concepts are weaving in and out of that text right there. Make sure you see that. You are adopted by God. God takes you because God wants you. God accepts you in the beloved because you are His. Folks, this is exactly why we have this inheritance that is so beyond our comprehension. Go back to 1 Peter 1, please. 1 Peter 1. This does not mean, however, and we need to make sure we get this, this does not mean that we will not have hard times. As he says in 1 Peter 1, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, 
you have been grieved by manifold temptations, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested with fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Peter is intentional the way he begins his epistle. God is your father. What that means is you have an inheritance, but let me be clear and up front. You are still going to face the fiery trials. You see how he does that? You're going to be burned. You're going to be hurt. You're going to touch those flames in this world, and you're going to be affected by them. But through it all, as he says at the beginning of verse 6, he says, in this you greatly rejoice. In what? In the inheritance that you have because God's your Father. In the hope of heaven that you have because God is your Father. That right there is precisely why you can face these fiery trials and come out the better on the other end. It's a fascinating thing to consider. Gold, when put through the flame is made more precious on the other end. You see, that's the point he makes, actually. See, when gold gets hot, the impurities melt away. And what you are left with is something more precious and more pristine, more pristine and more pure. That is exactly what God wants for you as his child, is to face those hardships, to face those difficulties, and come out the other end more <laughs> resolved, more faithful. Your hope didn't go anywhere, and most certainly your God did not go anywhere. That right there is exactly how we can hope through difficulties. And if you get to these points where you're struggling with some of these concepts, and you're beginning to feel like you've been overlooked, you're beginning to feel that you've been forgotten, you can kind of go back to your earthly realities you think about yourself as a parent. Have you ever forgot your child? Oh, left them at the Walmart once. Yeah. But I mean, have you really forgot that child before? Have you just forgot that child exists? Or, or maybe have you thought to yourself, well, really, I don't care about that child. You ever thought that? Now, don't you think that as God is presented as our Father, if you feel that way at all, don't you think he feels it to the nth degree further? Folks, I'm going to tell you, this is exactly why Peter in chapter 5, you can look at that if you'd like. This is exactly why he says in chapter 5, verse 7, you've got to see this. This is exactly why he says you can cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. Don't you get it, folks? That's, that's a powerful text. God cares about me and I can cast my, my burdens upon him. Why? Because he's your father. Because he cares about you the way a father does. Because he loves you like a father does. Except so much more. I, I look at my, my dad who is a, a big teddy bear. Nothing but sons. And as you might expect, a big man like that with nothing but sons is just not the most tender man. My, my daughters help with that. And though we are not very close, my dad is not a Christian. I can tell you one thing about my dad. There's no doubt in my mind my dad cares about me. I could call him at any hour of the night and lay out my heart to my dad. And my dad would sit there, probably fall asleep, but he would sit there because he cares. Now, now folks, you look at the flawed man. That's your father. But what we're talking about is one who has no flaws, one who has no imperfections, one who makes no mistakes because he's the creator and sustainer of life. He is the good God of the heaven and earth. He is the almighty creator. And he calls you his. And you can call him father. I think that makes a difference. Now, here, here's where we go with this. God is your father. That means you have an inheritance. But I've got to tell you, folks, this also means you better live like it. If you look at the text again, 1 Peter 1, let's begin. 1 Peter 1, actually beginning in verse 10. He says, Of this salvation, 
the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. I have often meditated on verses 10 through 12. He says, the prophets wrote about these things, though they did not understand them. They wanted to understand them. They wanted to know what they were about. And at the end of verse 12, he says, these were things that even the angels wanted to know about. Folks, do you, do you appreciate that what we have is what every hero we read about in the Bible wanted to have? The completed revelation. Do you know how significant that is? What that tells us, folks, is that we can go back to the text and we can say, look, there's God's track record. There's the way God acted with this individual, and that should give me confidence because when I make mistakes, I'm no better than David, but I'm also no worse. And yet God still wanted David. And I can look at these individuals who were so faithful, and I can find strength and be emboldened by them because they had less to go on than I do. Have you ever stopped and thought about what Abraham had to go on? Genesis 22, God tells him, you go and offer Isaac your son, your only son, on the altar. You know, Hebrews 11 says, Abraham concluded that God was able to raise him from the dead. Folks, you ever stopped and thought about the fact Abraham had never read where God had raised somebody from the dead. Abraham had never seen someone raised from the dead. It's not like he's, you know, God tells him, Abraham, go offer your son Isaac. And Abraham goes, I'm going to go read John 11 and talk about Jesus raising Lazarus. That's thousands of years after Abraham. There's nothing for Abraham to go on except the very word of God. And that's what Abraham counted on. He didn't know how God was going to do it, but he knew God could. Or when Noah's called by God to build the ark out of gopher wood, what is, was Noah just reading the prequel to Genesis? There was no prequel to Genesis. He's got nothing except the Word of God, the spoken Word of God, and that's all he's got. He's going to count on God. Folks, when, when it says Noah went and did all that God commanded him to do, we need to stop and think about that. He didn't have anything to go on except the Word of God. And yet that's where he kept going back to. Let me just put some of this in perspective. When God told Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you, do you recognize, folks, that Jesus in John 8 says that that's happening? We are living in the period that Abraham wanted to see. Jesus said Abraham did see it in a sense. Do you appreciate that when Moses says there's going to be a prophet that will come up among you that is like me, but he's so much better and so much greater in Deuteronomy 17, you recognize we're living in that period. Jesus is that prophet. When God told David, there's going to be an eternal throne that comes from your loins. There's going to be a line that will end in my king that I put there, and it will be an eternal dynasty. Do you appreciate? We're living in that period now. Oh, that's not that significant. Well, let me give you a few more. Joshua marching to Canaan's land. Folks, we're marching to Canaan's land. To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul of man never dies. We're marching to Canaan's land. We are living in the period that Joshua foresaw, that Joshua wanted to see. Or maybe that the Redeemer who lives, that Job spoke about. We're living in that day. Our Redeemer truly lives. The King, the psalmist foresaw, he's reigning now. We get to look at him and call him King Jesus. The day of the mountain of the Lord that Isaiah spoke about. It's here. The day of the new covenant Jeremiah spoke about. It's here. The dry bones of Ezekiel, they're here. We got it. The kingdom that will not be destroyed, no matter what man does. 
Daniel wanted to see it, and yet you and I, we get to live in it. Israel finally returned to God as Hosea wanted to see so badly. We are spiritual Israel. Once more faithful to God. The trumpet sounding in Zion and the holy mountain of Jerusalem restored. Joel wanted it, we've got it. Tabernacle of David raised, Amos wanted it, we've got it. Zion delivered, Obadiah would say, we've got it. The ruler in Israel has come. Micah wanted it, here we have, we've got it. Got it. The sons and daughters of Zion rejoicing. Zephaniah wanted to see it, and yet we've got it. The day has come that Zechariah and Malachi both wanted to see so badly. And they wrote so many verses about. We have got it. Folks, this is why. This is why he said the prophets searched for it. The prophets wanted to know. The angels desire to look into it, and here we have right in front of us. Verse 13, 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Therefore, you need to think about these things. Gird up the loins of your mind and the hope that is the end and the grace. Verse 14, you need to live as obedient children because God's your Father. Look at all that God has done for you. Look at all that God has done through history to get us to this point right here. Do you appreciate how truly blessed a people we are? That's because we're God's children. That's because we're His. And so we need to live as obedient children. And we need to, verse 15, be holy because He is holy. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but i got to tell you, folks, we don't live differently than the world around us just simply by virtue of wanting to be different. We live differently because God's our Father. I don't know if you had those conversations growing up. You'd want to do something and your dad would maybe tell you, we don't do that in my house. Ever had that conversation before? We will not do that in my house. Do you appreciate folks? God's saying that all the time about moral issues. That's God, our Father. He's saying, we don't do that in my house. We don't dress the way the world dresses. And I don't care about the event. We don't dress the way the world dresses. We can't do it modestly. We can't do it. Sorry. We don't drink what the world around us drinks. We don't go the places the world around us goes. And it's not because we're trying to be obstinate, not trying to be difficult. We're just trying to be holy because, because our Father is holy. Folks, that ought to put a different perspective on this discussion. I want to follow after God as a dear child. Remember that Ephesians 5 1. So I want to be like my Father. I want to be holy. Because he's holy. This discussion then feeds all through 1 Peter. We're going to hit just a few of these passages. If you'll turn along with me. Verse 13 we just read. Gird up the loins of your mind. You need to clear your head. You need to get your head on straight. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before. But it's, a, it's, it's kind of biblical. You need to get your head on straight. You need to think clearly about these things. Because you need to remember these points right here. That God is your father. You have an inheritance. It's going to be tough. But you need to live right. You need to be faithful to God because he's your father. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You might recognize that feeds right out of the comments at the end of chapter 1. You have been born again. You're a babe now in Christ. And what you need to do is live faithfully to King Jesus. And you need to be working towards that and hungering after the milk of God's Word. You live differently, don't you? Chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Oh, I know we want to discard that verse. And yet that's what the text says. We submit to the governing authorities. That ought to be impressive when you're thinking about the fact that Nero, who's going to kill Peter in a few years, is the one who's reigning when Peter says this. Didn't matter who was in charge. Obligation of God's people, don't make a fuss. You submit to the governing authorities. Why? Well, let me tell you, really easy, because God's your father. God's going to set all things right. Your inheritance is not part of this world anyways. So, hey, clue you in. No matter what the economy does, it doesn't affect your inheritance. No matter what this president or the next president does, 
doesn't affect your inheritance. You know why? Because it's reserved in heaven for you. No politician can touch that. <laughs> That's why we live faithful. That's why we submit. That's why we act this way and not other ways. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Now, this feeds right out of chapter 3 where he talks about Jesus has suffered to inherit glory. He suffered to inherit glory. His point in chapter 4 is, you live like Jesus did. It's okay. You might suffer. It's okay. You might face some pretty bad hardships. But don't go back into the world. Stick to God. Be faithful to your Father and live right. Chapter 4 verse 19. Chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good to, as to a faithful Creator. Folks, you're going to suffer. And you're going to be rocked and ripped and torn in this world. But through it all, you can be faithful to Him because He's faithful. You can depend on Him because He is dependable, because He is constant. Chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Folks, that concept of God being our Father weaves itself all through this book, all through this epistle. And that's how he gets to verse 6 and verse 7 of chapter 5, and it resonates with us. It clicks with us because we get it now. He's our Father. And this means something. It means He's there. It means He cares. It means we can look at Him and rely upon Him. And if that doesn't quite comfort you like it should, go back to chapter 1. Last verse we'll look at. Chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. I can rest at night because I know my Father is going to take care of the world. He's going to judge the world. That's going to be good for some. It's going to be really bad for others. But I'm going to tell you something. I go to bed at night knowing my father's the one who's going to do it. That, that reassures me. No, there's no partiality. But when you call him father, that means you're in a different class. You're a little different take on this. That last, last phrase, our sojourning, our wandering here in fear. I know in our world today, we don't like to talk about being afraid of God. Well, I, I got to tell you, folks, you should be afraid of God. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And throughout Scripture, you actually see that demonstrated. Israel w was not tickled and excited standing at Sinai. They were terrified. And, and God repeatedly in Deuteronomy tells them, hey, remember how you felt that day when you were scared to death of me? Don't forget it. He repeats that admonition about four or five times in Deuteronomy. Relate this to your home. Fathers, if your children are never afraid of you, then either you have got the most exceptional children I've ever seen in my life, and I want to know how you're doing it. I want to take some notes. Or maybe you're not doing your job very well. There's nothing wrong with your child being afraid of you. Afraid of disappointing you. Afraid of letting you down afraid of hurting your feelings, afraid of violating your command. They recognize you love them. You're not out to abuse that power. You're not out to hurt them. You're out to help them. And whatever fear you might impress upon them is going to help them later in life. 
Folks, if it's true even a remote sense to the Father we serve in our earthly temple, then it is absolutely true of our Father and God in heaven. It is okay to be afraid of God, but where it should get you then is to a place of reverence for God. I, I am in awe of what God can do, and I'm terrified. I'm terrified of ever leaving Him. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Because I know my Father wants to see me get home. Maybe the most wonderful connection to this very point. If you were to read Luke 15 and the prodigal son, you go read that account, and God is not this warmonger who's waiting at the gates to just slap his son around when he finally gets back. Ah, you should never have left. Don't ever come back here again. That's not him, is it? Folks, do you appreciate that that's God who's waiting, looking down the road, wanting, maybe today will be the day. Maybe today will be the day that I'll see my son come home. That's God in Luke 15. He wants you home. doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter the way you've lived. doesn't matter what you've squandered. He just wants you home. Folks, that's God. We've not necessarily talked about how you get home, although we did mention it briefly. By being born again, as he says in verses 22 and 23. It may be there's someone here tonight who has never been begotten by God, who's never been baptized for the remission of your sins. Well, folks, that's how it's done. That's how you are born again. That's how you are begotten by God. Maybe you have done that in the past, and like the prodigal, you have went into the world and squandered what God has given. We implore you. We beg of you to fix that, to make that right. Our Father, He's a good Father, and He wants you home. If you have a need of this congregation tonight, please make it known now as we stand.